The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Kalathi. Um, today, we're glad to have John Sigenthaler on board with us. John's a friend of mine, a friend of the industry. He's been doing this for, what, a couple decades now, I guess. So um, we had a little chat this morning before we started. I'm glad to see you're still excited about all the new technology and things that are coming out. I know you're working on some pretty uh, interesting projects there in your neck of the woods. So uh, hopefully at the end, we can talk a little bit about that. But I know we've got a lot to cover. You've got a lot to cover. You're doing the heavy lifting today, but I'll sit back and uh, try and answer questions as people type them in. But we're going to stay on at the end after our uh, polls and all that and uh, answer questions. So the beauty of doing online and everybody can hear the answer instead of, you know, trying to type them in later and get them to all, all y'all. So um, hydronics uh, 19, that's basically what we're going to be working on today. Siggy's going to do the first part of this, talk a little bit about design and theory and some of the things that are going on. And then I'll be back uh, next month, I guess and talk about some of the piping things that we see out there. What we basically did, we, I should say way at SIG does most of the heavy lifting on that, is we take pictures and uh, you know drawings that people send us about systems that they're having problems with, and we turn them into graphics. We don't want to just put people's work up there and say, well, there's where you know the piping was went wrong. You could switch it. So we've got a, a bunch of nice graphics that we'll have to show you some of the most common errors that are out there and, and what can be done to fix it. So that'll be the part two. Um, hopefully everybody signed up for hydronics. If not, you can go to our website and sign up and we'll make sure that you get those to you in the mail. Or if you need some back issues, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll help you with that. So, um, take it away, Siggy. Well, thanks, Rod, uh, and thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, the title of the program today, Hydronic Piping Systems Proven Designs. Uh, one of the things that uh, those of us that have been in the industry for a while have seen over the years is a tendency to what I call reinvent the wheel each time a new application, a new uh, project comes up. And there are times when that makes sense, but in general, uh, unless you're quite experienced at it, you can get into trouble with trying to uh, come up with a, a new design. So we're going to focus primarily on proven hydronic distribution systems today. And as Hot Rod was saying, the material that, that we built this Coffee with Kalefi uh, presentation around is, is drawn from Hydronics 19 that came out this past July. Uh, you can get that as a PDF file off the Kalefi site or sign up to get a hard copy. Um, what we're going to talk about today, basically we're going to go right down through a list of different types of proven hydronic distribution systems and we're going to end up with uh, a discussion on uh, distribution efficiency. So I, I won't read all these off to you, but they're, they're basically in an order from relatively simple distribution systems up to more elaborate concepts. So let's start off with some basic concepts. And actually, I'll start off with a question. Would you install a Ferrari racing engine in a lawn tractor and expect to be competitive at the next Formula One race, or, the, or for that matter, the next NASCAR race? And uh, here's a project. Now, this looks like some hot rod would, could probably build if anybody could. Uh, it looks like a good, powerful engine in a lawn tractor, and you can see they've got some pretty good tires on that thing. And I'm sure that thing's going to be using some kind of a, like a mini tractor pull competition. But from the standpoint of a racing vehicle, I don't think anybody would expect that that vehicle is going to perform very good at, at any kind of a race. And yet, the analogy here is we take, oftentimes, we want to take high-efficiency hydronic heat sources, be it a, a ModCon boiler or a geothermal heat pump, uh, a solar thermal collector, and we're just going to assume that what we connect that high-efficiency high heat source to is going to work uh, compatible with it. And it's really, uh, that thought is really as ridiculous as the, the photo of a, a V8 engine on a lawn tractor for a Formula One race. And oftentimes we get, we can get myopic in the sense that we focus our attention on the heat source. I, I've seen this many times over the years where uh, a contemporary heat source, uh, example, a geothermal heat pump. You, you might love the performance characteristics of a geothermal heat pump, and you simply assume, I'm going to get that box and I'm going to connect it the same way that I'd connect a cast iron boiler. I'm going to connect it to the same distribution system. And it's just gonna it's just gonna work. We you know we assume some miraculous compatibility between that new heat source and whatever that existing distribution system might be. And 
of course, there are problems are going to develop. And, and again, experience has shown that in many of these problematic jobs, it's not the fault of the heat source. It's not that the heat source is undersized. Um, it's not that it's you know, somehow uh, misbehaving. It's that it simply can't uh, operate in concert with whatever the distribution system is that connects to it. And, and a classic example would be to take a low temperature heat source like a geothermal heat pump system. Now, there are some geothermal water to water heat pumps today that can actually operate up as high as 150 degrees Fahrenheit, but a typical standard water to water geothermal, about 120 degree Fahrenheit supply water is about as hot as it can get. If you connect that to a system with baseboard, where that baseboard was sized around 180 degree or thereabouts water temperature, you're going to have immediate problems. The, the baseboard simply can't get rid of the heat at a low water temperature, and the heat pump can't get rid of the heat. So the heat pump's going to short cycle, or it's going to trip out on, on a high uh, refrigerant pressure safety or something like that. So it's really about compatibility between the heat source characteristics and the distribution system. Okay? And as I mentioned, there are times when customized distribution systems can be done, but without good experience, it's usually better, especially if you're new at it, it's, it's better to stay with proven design. So uh, kind of a theme today is don't reinvent the wheel with every new hydronic system. So let's switch over to some basic concepts. Uh, two types of hydronic systems, basically open and closed systems. An open system, as you see over here on the left, would be any type of a system that has at, at least one point open to the atmosphere. And of course, that prevents that system from building up pressure. There are successful applications for open systems, but they do have a number of uh, issues that you have to respect. One is any piping that goes above the water line in the tank. And you can see here, I've, I've shown a loop that goes up above that uh, atmospheric pressure line, that's going to be under negative pressure, uh, especially when the circulator is off. That's not necessarily a problem unless you have an air vent up there, or if the pressure were to drop low enough that the water would actually flash from a liquid into a vapor. And that has happened with some of the uh, open systems that have been used with outdoor wood furnaces, for example, where you can get uh, steam formation the moment the circulator turns off. The other issue with open systems is corrosion. Remember, oxygen is always available to the water, and when that water cools, it's going to absorb uh, gases from the atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, and that oxygen is going to get carried around through the system. So basically, you have water in a system that's absorbing and releasing oxygen over its entire life, and eventually that oxygen is carried to components like cast iron circulators, uh, flow checks, uh, steel expansion tanks, uh, panel radiators, anything that is a ferrous metal is going to eventually corrode. So we don't want to use that, those devices in combination with an open system. The majority of systems, at least in North America, are closed systems where we, we've sealed a system off from the atmosphere. The initial oxygen that is in that system is going to is going to react with ferrous metal in the system and you are going to get superficial corrosion. It really doesn't harm anything because that oxygen is quickly locked up in an oxide and you don't have a constant resupply. So most of the systems we're going to take a look at are going to be these closed systems. Another important concept as you're putting together a system is to think about the thermal mass of the heat emitters. And this graph over on the left it shows that there's a huge range of thermal mass. Uh, obviously, a concrete slab with tubing going through it is going to have a much higher mass than, for example, uh, a compact steel panel rad or a baseboard. Uh, it's actually about 100 times more thermal mass than some of the very low mass uh, convective panels that are out there today. Uh, another problem that you can see over here on the right, uh, with a high mass heat emitter system, think slab on grade with tubing in it. Think about a cold night. You know, we're going through the night here and we have a nice heat output from that floor. Everybody's happy. The, the floors are nice and warm and, and the building is maintaining set point. But then in the morning we start to get this internal heat gain. And, and I'm showing that 
starting at maybe 9 o'clock in the morning, 9.30. It could be sun. It could be people coming into the building. It could be equipment that's being turned on. Or it could be a combination of all that. Uh, solar gains are especially uh, problematic because if you've built a house with a lot of south-facing or south-easterly facing glass, on a clear day in the winter, you're going to get a lot of gain. So we get this very rapid input of heat. And remember, our slab is already warm when this begins because we've been pumping warm water through it all night. And the result is the slab really can't absorb that solar gain the way classic passive solar design um, architecture intended. So the result is uh, we get a very rapid increase in air temperature. And it's very possible we can get up into the low to mid 80s, uh, maybe by mid-afternoon and we'll be opening windows or perhaps a cooling system will come on. Uh, it's not a good situation from a comfort standpoint. The thermostat, I, I mentioned back here, the thermostat actually stopped flow through that high mass heat emitter maybe when the room temperature increased from 70 to 71. The thermostat's going to react quickly. But remember, just because the thermostat has stopped flow through there, that's not stopping heat output from the slab. And it's that heat output from the slab in combination with this internal heat gain that forces you up into these uncomfortable conditions. So in general, when you mix heat emitters with different thermal masses, you don't want to do it on the same zone circuit. We would not want to create a zone where we were operating a, uh, a four inch thick concrete slab and maybe a panel radiator or, or several panel radiators off the same thermostat. One is going to respond very quickly, the panel rads, uh, one is going to respond very slowly. So it's okay in a, in a situation, for example, you may have floor heating in a basement on its own thermostat and you may have panel rads or fin tube or fan coils, all of which are low mass emitters. You could have that on, a, on maybe the first floor or the second floor. As long as it's on a separate thermostat, it can react uh, based on that thermostat. Okay, so again, low mass heat emitters, I, I do have a preference for them in, in many cases, especially today with high insulation levels in buildings and uh, significant input, from, especially from the sun, a, a low mass heat emitter can respond very quickly, uh, both turning heat on and just as importantly, turning heat off. So again, as you design a distribution system, think about what type of heat emitters you're going to combine and if they are significantly different in thermal mass, put them on separate zones. This is a, a chart that shows what I'll call traditional water temperature ranges for several different types of hydronic heat emitters. And we'll start at the low end. This would be supply water temperature across the bottom. And uh, you'll see that first yellow bar there says floor heating with a bare slab. Uh, in some cases, the supply water temperature, even under design load, if you had an extremely low heat loss and a large heated floor area, that supply water temperature could be as low as 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And at the other end, I, I cut it off at about 110. If you're, if you're up over 110 on a slab, especially a bare slab, you may want to consider things like bringing the tubing closer together or reducing the load. But one of the ideal things about these low temperature emitters is it allows high efficiency on heat sources such as modcon boilers, heat pumps, uh, solar. Uh, it allows you to take a solar thermal storage tank down to a very low temperature and still contribute useful heat to the system. So as we move uh, into these other heat emitters, for example, if we put a covering over the slab, it could be a low pile carpet, it could be tile or perhaps 3 8 inch wood flooring glued down to the slab, you can see the temperature range shifts to the right. We're, we're forcing that heat to go through a, a greater resistance between the heat emitter and ultimately the space it's conditioning. So we have to do that by driving it out with a higher temperature differential. So it forces our temperatures up. Uh, a thin slab system like a pour gypsum underlayment or perhaps an inch and a half of concrete Again, between 110 and 130, it's a little higher than a bare slab would be with a thicker slab because your heat diffusion is not quite as good with a thin slab as it would be with a thick slab. And we get up into the plate systems above floor and under floor where we're using aluminum plates to pull the heat out away from the tubing. You notice the under floor tube and plate system requires higher temperatures than the above floor. That's basically because we've got another layer of wood 
typically a three-quarter inch subfloor that we have to drive that heat up through. Uh, wall and ceiling heating, again, if you haven't tried that and you're doing radiant floor heating, I'd, I'd urge you to take a good look at walls and ceilings. They can be real problem solvers in situations where somebody wants a high thermal resistance covering on a floor, for example. Uh, I've given them both a similar operating range and supply temperature from about a low of 90 up to 130. Uh, moving up, again, panel rads, a wide range of temperature here. Uh, fan coils, I've stopped on the low end at about 120 degrees. Some people may be willing to go a little lower. Be careful if you're using low water temperature and fan coils. Make sure that the air stream coming off that fan coil is well diffused into the space. You don't want to be blowing that air directly on somebody. You're going to get a complaint that there's drafts. Even though that air stream is still contributing heat to that space, you don't want that complaint about drafts. And then finally up here, we see, we see traditional sizing temperatures for cast iron radiators and fin tube baseboard. Uh, I put a low at about 160. And actually, you can find with fin tube, even today, you can find rating tables that go as high as 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, my suggestion, recommendation, nothing over 200 degrees. And, and even 200 degrees today is, is very hot in relationship to how distribution systems are being designed globally in Europe and in Asia. Uh, the, the distinct trend is towards low temperatures. Now, having said that, I'm, I'm going to come back to this. This is not a code. This is not a uh, ASHRAE standard or anything like that. It, it's simply an opinion. And it's my opinion that as you design future hydronic systems, design them so they can release design load output using a supply of water temperature no higher than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason I say that, uh, we don't we know that a well-designed distribution system could last for several decades. It's going to outlast its first heat source for sure, probably its second, maybe even its third heat source. We could be looking 50 plus years into the future and asking the question, do or does that distribution system that I'm designing today have a good chance of being compatible with a future heat source 50 years from now? And obviously we don't know what those heat sources are going to be, but the likelihood is that they're going to operate better at low water temperatures. It's basic thermodynamics. So why, why not take advantage of that design today so that it, it works today, but it also works 50 years from now, this idea of um, future-proofing your distribution systems. And the, the other note down here, don't always feel compelled to use traditional water supply temperatures. Thin to baseboard, as an example, it can operate at temperatures below 160, even though I've, I've cut it off there from, a, I'll, I'll say, a traditional design practice standpoint. You can actually operate fin tube at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you, you'd have to look up what the output is going to be. It's going to be low, but in a situation where we have low loss from the, the space we're heating and where we have ample wall space, it, you can't argue that it won't heat the space. It, it would. It's not traditional practice to do that, and you will need a lot of wall space if you design fin tube around 100 degree uh, Fahrenheit supply water temperatures. But I'm simply saying keep your mind open to the possibilities of don't feel constrained to always go with these traditional temperatures. Now, thermosiphoning or gravity flow or heat migration or ghost flow, these are all terms that have been out in the industry. And they all refer to a situation where we have heated water in some kind of a container. It could be within a boiler. It could be within a storage tank. And we've got a circuit that comes out somewhere in the upper portion of that tank. And you can see that here in the, in the left. And it, it goes through a piping path. And it, it says over here, any combination of pipe fittings, valves, anything that's unblocked. In other words, there's no flow check valve or no spring-loaded check valve. It's an unblocked path. The circulator doesn't have a check valve in it. What's going to happen is you're going to develop a reverse thermosiphon flow. And it happens because we have warm water here. Warm water is less dense. It's lighter than cold water. It wants to rise. And as we give up heat to this piping, uh, remember, as, as water just sits in a, in, a, in a pipe, it gives up heat. It's cooling. It's becoming more dense. It's becoming heavier, if you will, it's going to want to sink. So it's a self-propelled thermosiphon loop. 
And this can be bad news. This can actually dump heat into spaces where it's not supposed to be. Uh, those of you that have done solar thermal know this very well, that if you don't put a check valve into that glycol circuit between the solar collectors and the, the heat exchanger in the storage tank, you can dump a lot of heat back out at night. So we need to block that. And there's a couple ways we can do that. We can, we can block reverse flow with a swing check valve. And uh, I want to make sure everyone understands, swing check valves are not designed to go into vertical piping. They're designed to go into horizontal piping. You should have at least 10 to 12 pipe diameters of straight pipe upstream of that valve so you don't get rattling sounds from the valve due to turbulence. And make sure the bonnet is up. You know, everybody's probably thinking, well, nobody even saw one of these things upside down or with the bonnet horizontally. You might be surprised. Uh, now, a swing check valve can stop reverse flow, but it cannot stop forward flow. And over here, this is an example of forward heat migration. It's the same concept, but it's, um, it's going, in this case, from left to right. We can block most forward thermal siphoning with Traditionally, we'd use a flow check valve, what I call a weighted plug flow check. Uh, most of these valves are cast iron, and they have a plug that simply has a certain weight to it, and until that circulator turns on, the weight of that plug prevents this water. It's a weak pressure differential that, that drives thermal siphoning, a very weak differential, but it's persistent. So a spring-loaded check valve, most of these will have a forward opening resistance or pressure requirement of about 0.5, anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5 PSI. For most low-rise residential light commercial applications, that's going to be sufficient to block thermal siphon. And of course, we see today many circulators that have that spring-loaded check valve cartridge built into them, uh, both to prevent forward thermal siphoning and as well as reverse flow in, in a multi-circulator system. So again, every time you design a system or you're looking at a schematic, Ask yourself the question, are there some unblocked piping loops that have vertical displacement where there's a heat source and then there's a piping path that can dissipate heat? And if you see that, deal with it with, with one of these uh, options, either a swing check or a spring-loaded check valve. Okay, now one of the most basic ways that multiple heat emitters can be connected into a hydronic system is called a single series loop. Uh, there are a lot of systems designed originally like this, I'll say back in the 40s and the 50s. It's, it's a very simple idea. We simply go from one baseboard to the next. Uh, but there's some baggage that comes along with this. And uh, one of them is that you can't independently control the heat output from each heat emitter. Uh, if the pump is on, you have flow through everything. With baseboard, you can close the damper. Most baseboards uh, do have a damper. That's going to reduce the output some, but it's not as if it's stopping the heat output. So we might have a room with, with no solar heat gain and next to it a room with solar heat gain. How do we prevent the room with solar heat gain from overheating and yet still maintain heat into the room without the gain? Well, you really can't do that very well with a series loop system. Uh, again, keep in mind that these were designed in the days when most boilers had very low flow resistance. So a sectional cast iron boiler or steel fire tube boiler. Uh, you'll see here the circuit goes directly through the boiler. That was very common and, and still can be done with these types of boilers. So to summarize on a single series loop, I would say you could still use them in a small building with a single heating zone. Uh, and again, this is not the majority of applications today, but a 1,500 square foot house or something perhaps even smaller, big open space, it, it could still work. Uh, put down is not very common. Uh, the other issue that happens with series systems is there's always a temperature decrease from one heat emitter to the next. There are ways to compensate for that, but it's an undesirable aspect of a series uh, topology on, on the piping system. And it also says make sure you respect this concept of keeping the thermal mass of the heat emitter similar. Now, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to hand this over to Woody and back at Kalefi, and he's got a couple poll questions, and when we're done with that, we'll, we'll keep going. All right. I'm putting a question up there. So we're asking, when you design and install a system, how many boilers have all the flow passing directly through the boiler? 
uh, almost always 11%, most of the time 17, some of the time 33%, rarely 37%, and uh, I'm not sure it's 3%. So I would say some of the time and rarely are, are certainly the, uh, the two uh, highest percentages there. Yeah, when you design a system, how many uh, set up with anti antifreeze? I know the guys out west t tend to do more of the antifreeze uh, systems out there probably because there's a lot of vacant homes or uh, uh, second homes or cabins or something like that, but we're just trying to get a hand on how common it is to, to just use glycol in systems that, uh, that you're installing. Yeah, almost always 14%, most of the time 14%, some of the time 32, rarely 39, so we'll go back to the to the content. Okay. Well, you know, just to follow up on that antifreeze, uh, one of the formulas that comes in handy in hydronics, uh, if you have a heat emitter, anything that is dissipating heat and you know the rate of heat dissipation, and if it is water, if you take the, the BTUs per hour of heat dissipation, divide by 500, and then divide again by the flow rate, you'll get the temperature drop across that device. If you're using antifreeze, though, that 500 changes, and it changes at a 30% glycol solution, it changes to 485, and if you go all the way to 50% glycol, it drops to 450, which, which if you think about it, it's about a 10% drop. Now, this happens because the specific heat and the density of a solution of glycol, either propylene glycol or ethylene glycol, uh, actually thermally dilutes compared to water. It reduces specific heat. It reduces the ability of that fluid to actually absorb heat. And in the case 50% glycol, it's about a 10% reduction. So for example, if you had a buffer tank in a system and you've calculated how many BTUs that buffer tank could store based on water, if you operate that system with a 50% glycol, you're actually going to store about 10% less heat. So there, there is some baggage that goes with putting antifreeze into a system, but there are applications, as, as Bob was mentioning, second homes, cabins, obviously snow melt systems. We like antifreeze in systems where there's a garage slab that's being heated, and at times the owner might want to just shut that off and not worry about it in a cold climate application. So, Okay, so again, I want to emphasize when we have series heat emitters, we have this temperature drop from one heat emitter to the next. And the next slide here, this shows some software. Uh, this is the Hydronics Design Studio software. And one of the modules in that software will actually show you how that temperature drop is occurring. And right now, this system is configured for five baseboards. And if, if I start here, I've got it set for a supply temperature of 160. And um, I'm not sure, you can see these baseboard lengths are actually getting longer because they're actually, uh, the loads on all these baseboards are the same. They're, they're an assumed 10,000 BTUs per hour. So you, you'll see the lengths get longer, and the reason the lengths are getting longer is the supply temperature is going down from 160, uh, 156 going into the second baseboard, 152, and wherever you see this thermometer here, you can see a drop. And by the time we get to this last uh, output here, the, the drop is, is about 19 degrees there. And of course, you can, you can play with the different circulator selections, different pipe sizes, different fluids, and you can get very quick feedback on what's happening. But I put that in there primarily to show you that this series temperature drop is, is always going to occur. The lower the flow rate, uh, typically the greater the temperature drop. Okay, now let's move from a straight series system into a diverter T system. Some of you probably know these better as monoflow systems. Monoflow is actually a trademark of Bell & Gossett. Uh, they developed this monoflow fitting. Uh, generically, I call these diverter T fittings, and uh, they're characterized typically by this red ring. It's just a, a ring of, of paint. But if you were to cut through this T, you'd see inside there's actually a cone with an orifice in it. And this is designed to create a flow restriction and some of the flow coming into that T from the left, some of it will pass through that orifice and some of it will go out through the branch. So think of this flow restriction here. It increases the local pressure in the fluid and that will tend to drive fluid through a branch path, assuming that path is open or at least partially open. We can control the resistance of that branch path with a device such as a thermostatic radiator valve. If we don't want any flow through that particular heat emitter, this valve can close off. 
and even with a pressure differential developed here, there won't be any flow because there's not an open piping path through there. Uh, the, these fittings can go on supply or they can go on return. They have approximately the same net effect as far as the percentage of the main flow rate that will be diverted. So it doesn't make a lot of difference which way you do these. Um, if you have a system where you're going down from the piping main to a heat emitter, such as maybe in a basement, if you're going down to the floor level, putting a, a fin tube or a fan coil unit in, uh, it's common to use two of these, uh, one on supply and one on the return. And when you do that, make sure that red ring is towards the piping in between the T's always. So you can see here the red ring is towards the piping in between. Down here, same situation. These have gotten installed backwards and they just, they just don't work properly. So you definitely have to pay attention when you install them. Now this is a, I'll, I'll say this again is kind of an upgrade from a standard diverter T. This is a bypass valve. Uh, this is a Calefi product here and this is designed to screw up into the bottom of a what's called a compact style panel rat where the center to center distance uh, 50 millimeters or just about two inches and you can see that screws up in there and what it does is it provides I'll say the functional equivalent of a, of a bypass. So we could have what appears to be a series circuit of three panel rads here but notice each panel rad has its thermostatic radiator valve on it and let's say this first valve is partially open but these two are closed. What's going to happen is that flow is going to come in. Now some of that flow is actually going to be allowed up through the panel rad so we'll get some heat output and then it'll come back, it'll join with the flow that bypassed across here and it'll go on and it will um, it will not pass up through that radiator because that valve is closed and so is this one. So this allows you to have what appears to be a series circuit and, and installs very easily like a series circuit but it, it allows you to have independent heat output control on each of those heat emitters and that particular valve as I mentioned specifically set up for compact style panel reds. So it's, it's a nice option, but suggestion is to limit this to about three panel reds. If we put six or eight of these things in series, we're going to get a very large temperature drop. And again, that's not a desirable characteristic. So in a situation where you might have, for example, three bedrooms that are in a given area of the building, uh, it's, it's possible to use this, but don't go all the way around a house and tie eight or ten of the panels into this. Okay. Now, Another valve-based strategy is to use zone valves. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea of a zone valve. The zone valve would open when the thermostat in the zone uh, operates the, the actuator motor on the zone valve. Here's a schematic. We've got flow balancing valves installed here so we can actually determine what the flow rate is in each system. I like to put the zone valves on the supply side and the reason I do that is to stop thermosiphoning. Hot water will, will it, under certain conditions, you can get a two-directional thermal siphon flow in a pipe. It's not a strong effect, but the idea is don't allow that heat to go beyond that zone valve if that zone valve is closed. So I prefer to put the zone valves on the supply side. Uh, the other important concepts here, when you do a system like this, uh, if you look at this dashed black line that I've drawn in here, we call that the common piping. And the concept is simple. You want to keep the flow resistance the pressure drop, the head loss of the common piping as low as possible. By, by doing that, you minimize the change in flow rate in each zone circuit when other zones open or close. All right, so uh, theoretically, if we could have zero head loss through our common piping, and let's say two zones are operating at certain flow rates like 2 GPM and 3 GPM, and we open up that third valve, those first two circuits don't change at all. That's, that's the utopian concept. Um, so keep the flow resistance of the common piping low. If you are using a fixed speed circulator rather than one of the new uh, differential pressure regulated circulators, you should look for a circulator that has a relatively flat pump curve. You do not want to use a high head circulator in a system with zone valves, with any type of valve based zoning. Uh, because you get large changes in differential pressure across the headers as zones open and close, and that is going to cause 
significant changes in flow rate through those zone circuits. So again, fixed speed circulator, look for a flat pump curve. Today's state-of-the-art technology would be a differential pressure controlled circulator operating under constant differential pressure mode. And over here you see a nice header, uh, a good generously sized header. Here's, a, here's an example of one of those uh, differential pressure regulated circulators driving that. Uh, purging provisions on the return side of each zone. Nice, nice pipe work there. Here's another valve-based system. We're going to go to a, what, what I call a home run system. It's really one of my favorite distribution systems because it's simple, it's repeatable, it's extremely good when you're doing retrofits. And it's essentially the idea of coming off your heat source and going to a manifold. The manifold could be as simple as, a, as several copper T's soldered together or it could be a nice brass manifold. Uh, you're going to run circuits of flexible tubing. The common size is half inch, um, half inch PEX or PEX aluminum PEX. And you see the idea, each, each, in this case, each panel rad has its own circuit going from the supply manifold through the panel and then back to the return manifold. Each panel rad has a thermostatic radiator valve. So literally you have six independently controlled zones of heat here with very simple piping. That piping is easy to pull through framing cavities. Uh, both in new construction as well as retrofit. And again, the, the concept, keep the common piping, low flow resistance, and again, a, a differential pressure regulated circulator operating on constant differential pressure mode is an ideal combination with this home run distribution system. And finally, you can mix heat emitters. I, I'm showing all panel rads here. You could mix some baseboard, some fan coils, just make sure that you size them all based on the same supply water temperature. Whatever that temperature is, it, it's going to be common to all the circuits that are connected to the manifold. Now we're going to switch again back to a system, a uh, traditional system using rigid pipe. Uh, of course, originally it was all metal pipe, but today this could be metal, it could be a polypropylene pipe, it could be a combination. Uh, this is called a two-pipe direct return system. And you'll see we've got a, a circulator and we have several branches or what I've referred to as crossovers. And the word crossover means it crosses from the supply main shown in red to the return main here in purple. So we've got a zone valve that can open or close to allow or deny flow through that particular crossover. We've got a balancing valve. This could be a manually set balancing valve or it could be an automatic balancing valve. And it, we have some kind of purging valve. We want to make sure we can blow the air out of that system quickly. Uh, so we've got a crossover here and we've got what? We've got four or five crossovers in this system. The thing I want you to see about these crossovers, um, this crossover is definitely closest on supply and the return and closest to the circulator. Uh, the next one is farther out. There's more piping here that the flow has to pass through to get out to the beginning of that second crossover. And likewise, there's more piping to get back here. And this trend continues all the way out to the end. Now, I'm going to make an assumption. Let's assume that these crossovers are identical construction. Same heat emitter, same tube size, same zone valve, so forth. So they would have five equal hydraulic resistances. What's going to happen without any adjustment on the balancing valve is the, the greatest flow is going to pass up through here. There's going to be less flow through here and so forth and so on. And you may run into a problem by the time you get out to the end here of just insufficient flow to generate sufficient heat output. So the balancing valves are in there so that we can actually choke down the flow rate a bit here. We, we don't want an overflow condition on that first crossover at the expense of an underflow condition out here. So we can balance these and, and one of the hydronics issues uh, has a whole discussion on how to do that. Um, but in general, a two-pipe direct return system is it's acceptable, but keep in mind, it always has to have balancing. And, and make sure that if you're designing a system like this, you do calculations uh, to tell what that flow rate should be through each one of those crossovers. Uh, again, this is a good setup for a variable speed pressure regulated circulator. But when you do this, you'll see one of the points down at the bottom here. Uh, you want to set that variable circulator to a different operating mode. Uh, in the previous systems, we've been setting that to constant differential pressure. Now we want to set it to what's called proportional differential pressure. And without spending a lot of time on it, this concept is, 
it's all based on trying to minimize any change in flow rate through an active crossover if another crossover turns on or shuts off. And it, it factors in the, that there is significant pressure drop or head loss in this uh, supply main as well as in the return main. So most of the pressure regulated circulators today have both a constant differential pressure mode and a proportional differential pressure mode and it's just a matter of selecting it. Uh, so for this type of piping layout, that proportional is better. Now this is also a two-pipe system, it says direct reverse return, strike the word direct. This is actually a reverse, re should say reverse return. And the difference here is you'll see the first takeoff point for the first crossover nearest the pump is actually the farthest away from getting back to the pump. So first return, last, first supply, last return, okay, second to first supply, second to last return, and so forth. And finally we get down here, the last crossover to be supplied is actually the first one. It's closest to the circulator on the return. Now this will help in what I'll call naturally balancing the system. And I, I want to stress to you, this in itself, by itself, is not a guarantee that the system is fully balanced. It's a step in the right direction, but you'll still see the need for balancing valves in there. Uh, oftentimes we find people put a little bit too much confidence in the fact that if they design a reverse return system, that everything will be self-balancing, we don't need to worry about it. And there's various degrees to how true that statement could be. If all these crossovers are identical, and if all the main piping is designed for approximately equal head loss, you could be pretty close to self-bouncing. But there's no guarantee that's going to happen. These, these crossovers could have very different load characteristics to them. For example, that might be 5,000 BTUs per hour. This might be 20,000 BTUs per hour. They, they definitely need different flow rates, different pipe sizes, different pipe lengths. So it is important to make sure that balancing valve is in there. And again, the pump would be set up for a proportional differential pressure mode of operation. Typically, two-pipe direct return and two-pipe reverse return systems are more common in commercial, industrial applications compared to residential. It's not to say they can't be used in, for example, an upscale residential project, but more common in commercial. Now, here's something you want to tend to avoid. This is what I call a dead-end reverse return. All right, this is where, if you look, you'll see the first crossover on supply is the last on a return, but look at what it has to do for that return. It has to go all the way out here, do a U-turn at the end, and come back. And the, the problem with this is not that it doesn't work. The problem is it adds quite a bit to the piping cost because this has to be the largest piping size all the way from the far dead-end of that distribution system back through your heat source. So we tend to want to stay away from those dead end layouts. The, the best layouts would be, if I go back to this, where we are basically making a circle, a loop around the, typically around the perimeter of the building, um, that, that's preferred. Okay. Now let's move on to multiple circulators. Uh, there's many, many hydronic systems today that have two or more circulators that will operate simultaneously. When you do that, you don't want these circulators interfering with each other. You want a characteristic called hydraulic separation between the circulators. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, we've spent uh, past webinars talking about that. We've also, uh, there's a couple issues of hydronics. Uh, number 15 is the latest one that talks about this in depth. The bottom line here to, to get good hydraulic separation between circulators is to identify the common piping, whatever it is. Now, this is obviously a very simple representation of something that represents a common piping. It could be a tank, it could be piping, fittings. Whatever it is, it has to have low flow resistance. The lower the flow resistance of the common piping that all the circuits share, the higher the degree of hydraulic separation. And a high degree of hydraulic separation will allow very minimal change in flow rate. For example, if we had circulator number one operating and circulator number two was off, we have a certain flow rate established based on the pump curve and the system head loss curve. Let's just call that uh, 10 GPM. Okay? Now, if we turn on circulator number two, we get a little bit more flow through this common piping and its head loss goes up slightly, and that's the key, very slight increase 
in head loss. So that flow rate moves down. Let's say it moves from 10 down to 9.95 GPM. You, you could say, well, the, the, the flow was changed. It was, but that difference is insignificant in terms of its effect on heat transfer. So we would say we have a high degree of hydraulic separation. Again, the key idea, you can see down here, here's uh, four zone circulators. That piping that is within the dash black line, the lowest flow resistance you can practically make is giving you the highest degree of hydraulic separation. Now, one way to do that, one way to get hydraulic separation between circulators is to use um, primary secondary piping. Here's a, here's a classic, what's called a series primary loop, where we have multiple secondary circuits uh, that are connected to the primary loop with closely spaced T's. And the heat source itself has its own dedicated circulator and closely spaced T's. Uh, this works from a hydraulic separation standpoint, but again, we have series relationships here between these connected secondary loads. We're going to have lower water temperatures here than we do here. We have to compensate for that. Over here is a lesser known type of primary secondary. It's called parallel primary loop. And you'll see that we've created three crossovers so that we have the same water temperature coming into each set of closely spaced T's. That takes care of the problem of series temperature drops. And it also provides hydraulic separation, but arguably at more expensive, more elaborate piping with balancing valves and, and T's and so forth installed. So we want to move to the next concept, and that is let's retain the benefits here of equal supply temperature and hydraulic separation, but let's do it with a simpler piping layout. And that takes us over to a hydraulic separator. The hydraulic separator uh, essentially gives you that separation, in this case, between the boiler circulator and anything connected to this header. And again, you want to have these headers as short and as, as large as you can. Uh, I, I suggest a flow velocity with all these circulators running not over two feet per second. And that's a pretty aggressive recommendation or suggestion. Uh, it's very likely going to upsize your header at least one pipe size beyond what you're used to. But it does keep the pressure drop along the length of that header very, very low. So again, look at the dash black line here. Our common piping has very low head loss. We're going to have a very good degree of hydraulic separation. And something like a SEP4 hydraulic separator is, is uh, not only is it providing the hydraulic separation, it's giving you the high performance air separation at the top, good magnetic dirt separation down at the bottom. So multiple functions in one device. And again, Hydronics number 15, if you want to read more about it, has got a, a good discussion on it. And then we're going to do multiple temperatures. And, and obviously today we have a lot of multi-temperature systems where we have a mixing assembly in between a heat source loop and a load loop. Okay, and as you're seeing it here, notice that all the heat that passes from the heat source circuit over here on the left to the load circuit has to go across the mixing assembly. So I like to think of the mixing assembly as a bridge. And we can control the traffic across the bridge anywhere from zero all the way to the maximum heat output rate of that heat source. Now, when we have a heat source that does, is not subject to flue gas condensation, and an example would be, let's say, a thermal storage tank with a heating element, or another would be a buffer tank heated by a ground source heat pump or a solar collector, when we're not concerned about flue gases condensing, the mixing assembly actually only has to respond to the supply water temperature sensor. Uh, this could be a set point, or it could be controlled. The mixing assembly could be controlled based on outdoor reset, which is nice. But the key point here is we don't need to be concerned about the return temperature when we have, again, a heat source that is not subject to flue gas condensation. Uh, you might think, well, gee, a, a ModCon boiler can have flue gas condensation, and it's desirable. There are a few applications where it makes sense to use a mixing assembly with a ModCon boiler, but in general it doesn't. Let the ModCon boiler run the water temperature based on outdoor reset control. You really don't need to put mixing valves downstream and mix it down farther unless you have, for example, two different radiant panel constructions. We might have a tube and plate system on the first floor where we're trying to get, 100, let's say, 120 degree water and in a basement where we're trying to get 95 degree water. We could set up the heat source for the higher temperature. 
We can go direct to the upper uh, floor system without mixing, but we would have to mix it down for the lower system. But I, I do see a, a number of applications that come in where we see a ModCon boiler and mixing valves, and uh, many times it's just not necessary. You, you don't need those mixing valves. Okay, when we have a heat source that does have flue gas condensation, we have to regulate that mixing assembly based on two things, uh, the supply water temperature and the boiler inlet temperature. We, we prevent sustained flue gas condensation in a heat source by keeping that boiler inlet temperature above a certain minimum. Uh, a good round number to remember is 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this applies to gas, it applies to oil, it applies to propane, it applies to wood, uh, especially wood chip boilers. A lot of, uh, there's higher moisture content going in with some of these wood chips and those, those boilers can condense. So we need to determine from the boiler manufacturer what is the minimum boiler inlet temperature that's acceptable without sustained flue gas condensation and make sure that our mixing assembly can monitor that temperature and adjust to that temperature. The way it would do this is if this temperature is too low, it's actually going to restrict the amount of flow that goes off, or the amount of heat transfer, I should say, that goes into this load circuit, potentially right down to zero until this loop comes up to a proper temperature where we don't have sustained flue gas condensation, and only then will the bridge start to allow some heat transfer over into the load circuit. And you can do this with three-way valves, with four-way valves, motorized valves, that is. You can do this with a variable speed injection system. You can do this with uh, two-way valves that modulate. There are several different hardware configurations. Uh, check out Hydronics number seven if you want to get a, a detailed look at all those different mixing assemblies. Again, I'm treating it as just a generic assembly because the concept of boiler protection applies regardless of the hardware that we use to implement it. Now, here's another way to do multiple temperatures using distribution stations. Uh, these are a combination of a manifold, a circulator, and a mixing valve, and Kalefi offers these both with thermostatic mixing valves as well as motorized mixing valves, and uh, you'll see a cross over here. So this is basically a bypass. So if we have more flow than we need here, uh, some of that flow can bypass. So it essentially puts together the functional elements that we need for circulation, for temperature regulation, and for hydraulic separation. And here would be a, a couple of these things set up. You see they basically connect across a header system. Uh, a balancing valve would be put in so we, we can uh, balance the, the flow that goes out there. But I also want you to notice, uh, if these are operating at low temperatures, like a low temperature floor heating system, we still need to protect that conventional boiler against sustained flue gas condensation. We can do that with a three-way thermostatic valve, but again, I want to stress something. Make sure that the flow characteristic of that three-way valve is, is compatible with the flow going through this boiler. If we put a valve here that has a CV of about 2.3 or 2.5, a valve that was designed basically for anti-skull protection in a domestic water system, we're going to have a severe flow restriction here. Uh, there are valves on the market that have much higher CVs. Those would be appropriate for boiler protection. Here's another one. This is uh, basically modifying that last system into, uh, I'll call it kind of a, a mix, if you will. You're probably thinking it's a home run system in the sense that we have, uh, I'm showing flexible tubing going out to these three different manifold stations or distribution stations. Each of these can be set at different temperatures. You can see this is set for 105, 90, and 110, just, just to pick three numbers. Uh, again, the three-way thermostatic valve is in there for boiler protection. I'll call it a master manifold here with satellite distribution station. So it's a very flexible concept when you have buildings that require, especially radiant panel systems that require different water temperatures in different zones. It's, it's a simple system to provide that. Okay, uh, distribution efficiency. Now, uh, hopefully we've got some folks from Italy watching here. Uh, I threw this one in. This is a quote from Enzo Ferrari. Aerodynamics are for people who can't build engines. And I, I always thought that was a pretty uh, interesting quote. Obviously, 
Mr. Ferrari there is building some very high performance engines. And um, the, uh, the people that are in the body design department, I, I don't know if they're listening to the boss here because that looks like a pretty aerodynamic body to me. But it's an interesting concept. In, essentially what he's saying is don't worry about the fluid drag in the system or in the case of a car, the air resistance over the body. Just overpower it with the engine. Okay. Well, that's, you know, again, these engines are impressive in, in terms of what they can do. But that's really not good if you're trying to conserve energy, especially electric energy that goes in to drive the distribution system. So my response on that would be good energy delivery system design, hydronic system, whatever it is, is not just about overpowering resistance. It's about using materials and methods that reduce resistance and achieve equal or better results with lower input energy. So oftentimes we get, again, so focused on the thermal efficiency of the heat source that we forget about how much electrical power we're putting into the distribution system. And, you know, I, I use uh, uh, aerodynamics as a good example. Here's, here's a powered parachute ultralight. It's got a 65 horsepower engine, and that engine is pushing that through the air at about 32 miles per hour. Okay. Now, over here is a, uh, this is a Burt Rutan design. A uh, very interesting home-built airplane. It's called a Quickie, and it looks like the landing gear here provides about half the wing area. But this thing will go 126 miles per hour on an 18 horsepower engine. So, you know, why can this go so much faster with even, you know, a fraction of the horsepower? Well, it's about the aerodynamics of this at, as an aircraft versus this. This is this is high lift, high drag. This is very very low drag. So. Again, it's a good analogy. Uh, you can make similar analogies with boats and with cars, but when we design hydronic systems, um, we should be thinking about the amount of energy going into that distribution system. And we can actually compare different designs using this concept of distribution efficiency. And it's a very simple idea. You take the design, uh, design load rate of heat delivery and you divide it by the electrical wattage that's operating the distribution system. And the higher that number comes out, the higher the distribution efficiency, the, the better the system is. In other words, it's delivering a given amount of energy on less electrical input power. And I did a quick comparison here. Let's say we had four circulators operating at 75 watts each, delivering 100,000 BTUs per hour. If we put those numbers into the formula, we get this number 333. And then I compared it to a blower that's drawing 550 watts and delivering 80,000 BTUs per hour. And you can see it's, it's uh, actually less than half of the distribution efficiency. So we can compare hydronic to forced air systems, but we can also compare different hydronic designs. And I can tell you with good design today, with high efficiency uh, ECM type circulators, you can actually drive this number over 3,000 BTUs per hour per watt with, with state-of-the-art hydronic design. Imagine a house with a a 62,000 BTU per hour design load, and that load is being supplied using 25 watts of electrical power into the circulation system. That's going to have, uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's going to have a very high distribution efficiency, and it shows a distinct advantage of water versus uh, air. Okay, um, I know we're, we're running out of time here, but I, I want to just mention there are some slides, and if you download the PDF, you can take a look at this. I started doing some comparisons between multiple circulator systems and zone valve systems. And this, very quickly, is just a comparison between running four circulators on high speed at 87 watts each, all right, where we have uh, each zone delivering 12,675 BTUs per hour. We have four pumps at 87 watts each. So we have this number, 146 BTUs per hour, being delivered per watt of electrical input. But if we switch those circulators down to low speed, to 60 watts, notice that our heat transfer goes down a little bit, and that's a key. It drops, but it, it doesn't go down in proportion to our power input. It drops, actually it's only about a 2.9% reduction in heat transfer, but notice our distribution efficiency has gone up significantly. So here's a summary. We've reduced our electrical power input by 31%. We've only lost... 2.9% of the heat transfer, and we have a 40% increase in distribution efficiency. So again, the takeaway, scrutinize your designs. 
Uh, we see examples of systems with you know, 25 plus circulators lined up on a wall in a, in a high-end house. It looks impressive. It may be great from a craftsmanship standpoint. Uh, it may even win you an award, but it's not the right approach for state-of-the-art hydronics. And just to show you a comparison, here's another system. Instead of using zone circulators, this uses a, a single circulator, not a high-efficiency circulator uh, at first just a single circulator and if we operate that on high speed and we have this this is showing a home run distribution system our distribution efficiency is 516 now that significantly higher than what we had on the previous slide with zone circulators if we drop that one circulator down to 60 watts we go from 516 to 701 but if we switch to a ECM circulator and in, in a ballpark estimate, we get about twice the wire-to-water efficiency with that technology. Look at what our distribution system efficiency is. Remember, we're starting out in, in a range of about 300. Now we're over 1,400. So in general, a valve-based zoning approach, especially when it's used with a high-efficiency variable speed circulator, is going to give you higher distribution efficiencies, and ultimately, it's giving you a system that uses less energy. Now, my last slide here, I'm going to hand it back over to, uh, to Bob. Uh, he's got a Coffee with Galefi webinar coming up on October 20th, which is going to show you all the wrong things to do. And We found over the years that actually showing people what not to do in a hydronic system can be very um, instructive. People tend to latch onto this as opposed to telling them just what to do. So just a couple examples of systems that have got incorrect detailing. Anytime you see that big X across it, uh, it's not really something you want to do. And again, there's a whole section in Hydronics 19 devoted to this, and, uh, and Bob is going to elaborate on that coming up on October 20th. And with that, Bob, I'm going to hand this back over to you. Yeah, thanks. That was uh, that was quite a quite a mouthful. I know we got hundreds of questions here. I've been trying to get. To, I hope you don't hear me typing as you're going here. I got to quite a few of them, but all right. So you take it from here. Questions? Yeah. Well, I'm going to start off with one question here, and that uh, okay. what the real engineers can. When do re real engineers consider themselves well dressed? And uh, the answer is when their socks match. So I know we've got quite a few engineers on the program today. So check your socks and see if you're a well-dressed engineer. And uh, I'll open with that, and then uh, Bob, I'll go back to you, and uh, we'll fire away with these questions. Yeah, one of these again, it, it's it's hard to to read through the, some of these when they're long. It says you seem to be redefining what an open system is compared to a closed system. Traditionally, open systems are systems that have contact with air or gas at more than one place. And closed systems are those in contact at one place or less, such as a diaphragm expansion tank. I also question your illustration in the slide designated as open, sort of misleading in the sense that a pipe elevating as you show it is not only will the air be expelled in the top of the boiler due to the elevation of the water column. Yeah. Well, you know, when we talk about where the air and the water meet, uh, I'm thinking that he, he might be thinking that in an expansion tank there's actually air meeting up with water, but, but that is still within a closed compartment, if you will. Uh, an open system, it really only has to have one point where it's exposed directly to the atmosphere. And it doesn't have to be a large opening, it could be a very small opening. And, and a common example is an unpressurized thermal storage tank. Uh, these are common in, in solar thermal systems, they're common with wood-fired boilers. And sometimes the venting is, is a very small opening, like a quarter inch diameter opening. Uh, as long as there is contact, and I'll try to be specific, not between, I'll say, just air and water, like you would have, you could have that in a closed system with a, with a non-diaphragm or, or a non-diaphragm traditional expansion tank. You have air and water in contact, but that's all within a closed system. Uh, in an open system, it's one or more points at which the atmosphere can make contact with the water. Uh, and that piping that goes up above the tank there, uh, I'm not saying it has to be above the tank for it to be an open system. If it is above the water level in the tank, the pressure will be negative in that pipe when the circulator is off. It has to be because the atmospheric pressure level is at the water level. In this case, I, I've shown a tank. 
there, you know, that is a fixed zero psi atmospheric pressure point. You can't change that. You can't increase that or decrease that. So pressure in the fluid, static pressure in the fluid below that level would be positive. It goes up roughly about 0.43 psi as you go down per foot below the surface. Same thing, only negative going upward. So um, again, a differentiating between the atmosphere and the water making contact versus what I'll just say air within a standard expansion tank making contact with the water. And then he asked about the calculations to back that up. I think it was hydronics number 10, Siggy, the one that we did on, on wood-fired boilers and stuff like that. You did have the math in there to show yeah. how, you know, and I know we showed it again, I think in hydronics number nine or 19, we showed it again. But if you go back to hydronics 10, we did have the math in there for how you can calculate what that, uh, essentially we're trying to show what the boiling point could be at a negative pressure in that uh, upper. Right. Uh, and, and I want to stress, too, that that negative pressure is when, when the pump is off. Now, you could have a situation where you would have negative pressure. Let's say, let's say 4 PSI negative below atmospheric pressure when the pump is off. When the pump turns on, depending on what the resistance of that circuit is, under pump on conditions, the pressure might go positive. Okay? But once that pump shuts off, it's going to go back to negative. So, in other words, the pressure differential of the pump is going to influence what the pressure distribution is in that circuit if it's up above the water level. In general, though, we try to avoid it, especially in high temperature systems, because if that pressure drops below the vapor pressure of the water, the water will change immediately from a liquid into, into a vapor. And some of these wood fired furnaces can easily get that water temperature up 180, 190 degrees. When the circulator's on, it, it may be okay. But when that circulator turns off, if that pressure drops, as I say, if it drops negative enough to hit the vapor pressure curve, and, and we've got that in, I know that's in hydronics number 12, uh, if it gets down the vapor pressure, it's going to flash off the steam, and you're going to get knocking sounds as those, that steam implodes as it, as it uh, goes away. So, it, again, the implication is not that you can't or shouldn't do an open system, but there are definite things you have to think about that are different, like these pressure distributions as well as uh, the corrosion aspect of a system where you have the atmosphere and the water in contact. Yeah, I think that answers. And to make it even more complicated, some people consider an open system where they're combining their domestic water with their boiler or their heating water. And I know there's some of those still being put in where the water heater does both. Uh, domestic water and heating. Now, obviously, when a faucet opens, it's, it's an open system, and when no faucets are flowing, it's a closed system. So those sometimes get called open systems, and that, I think, confuses the two, which is what is an open system, I guess. By yeah, it's, it's semantics. It's, it's basically the same word for two different things. Uh, but, you know, I think the term open with the domestic water system, the, uh, the situation there is you've got dissolved gases in the domestic water. Uh, you've got oxygen and nitrogen, cold water, at atmospheric pressure, if I remember, is in the range of two or three percent dissolved gases, uh, and uh, maybe 78 percent nitrogen, 16 percent oxygen. Again, if if I remember right, so there is oxygen in fresh water, and that oxygen will react with ferrous metals in the system if those are present. So, again, look at the circulator manufacturers. Just about all of them offer either bronze or stainless steel variations on their circulators specifically for that that application of you know domestic water in the system uh, as well as a system that has for example a storage tank with an atmospheric vent to it yeah and we don't necessarily endorse that type of system where you're mixing potable water and heating water for you know bacteria and other issues but uh, you know, knowing that they're out there and you might have to work on them someday know too that it, with the new low lead thing anything that you put in that loop has to be a low lead a pump or valve or uh, you know anything that touches it has to be low lead. Now another question, Siggy, getting and this was a good one too. Getting back to the uh, monoflow T system, it says your illustration of monoflow T appears to be wrong according to the OBNG catalog. Typical low resistance applications have a standard T on the entry to the radiator and the fitting on the leaving side. High resistance radiators would have two fittings, entering and leaving, which I think you mentioned. By adding a radiator valve, you probably make this into a high resistance application and would require two fittings entering and leaving. If the valve is removed, then the lower schematic um, is the proper orientation for the monoflow. So 
This might be yeah, a okay. person. <laughs> yep. Well, um, you know, the key word I think was probably there. Uh, you got to do the math. Uh, it depends on what that flow resistance of that branch is and what flow rate you're trying to achieve through there. If if this was a very small pathway up through here and it had relatively low flow resistance, and again, I'm saying if, it's possible that either this configuration or this configuration would provide sufficient differential pressure to get the flow that you're looking for. Now, to that questions point, if this is a a uh, high flow resistance pathway, either depending on what the flow resistance of the valve is, what the heat emitter is. For example, if I take this thin tube out and I put a fan coil in here that has a, a much more constrictive flow path and, and perhaps I throw some other fittings, valves in there, completely different story. And, and to that point, I would agree, under those conditions, you'd want to look at the possibility of a fitting on both the supply and the return to generate additional differential pressure. So again, I, I don't want to generalize and say, you know, whenever there's a thermostatic valve involved, you have to use two T's. That's that's you know, that's putting the math out, out of the picture. You really shouldn't design that way. You really should evaluate it. And there are methods to do that. There are methods, uh, basically there's a CV associated with this. So if we're using two of these, we could calculate the differential pressure produced by the upstream diverter T, and we could also calculate a, di a differential pressure if we had another diverter T on the return. And basically, we'd add those two differential pressures together, and that would tell us the available differential pressure to push flow through here. And then it's a matter of what kind of flow can we generate through the branch based on that differential pressure. If, if one fitting isn't enough, we can go to two. Um, you know, another comment on diverter T systems, they work, there's many of them out there, we've designed them, but we haven't designed these in, in a long time because th there simply are other methods out there like the home run distribution system that tend to be easier to deal with uh, using flexible tubing and so forth that don't create these uh, series temperature drop situations. So uh, again, we want to show it because it is part of the North American hydronics practice, and it can still be used today, but it's not as common today as it once was, and uh, part of it is what we just talked about. How do I know? Do I need one T or two Ts? Uh, traditional practice has, has said that if the main is up above the heat emitter, use two Ts. I, I mean, that's, that's a very generalized rule of thumb, but it, you know, it can't guarantee you that even with two Ts, you have sufficient flow. So uh, I guess I'd have to leave it. You have to evaluate between one T and two Ts. Don't just assume that you know you always need two Ts or you, you can get away with one. Just do the math and make a decision. Can you talk a little bit about distribution uh, pumping, you know, where we've got a boiler and the uh, single pump? Uh, I know a lot of the new boiler manufacturer installation manuals with these uh, wide open uh, fire tube type of uh, heat exchangers saying you're fine with just putting a single pump. Uh, that can handle the flow through the boiler as well as through the distribution. And then the question becomes, okay, if I can use a single pump, should I use a delta T pump? Should I use a delta P pump? How do I know what, what's the guidelines to tell me what some of the, um, you know, okay. your thoughts on that, I guess? Well, again, uh, I, I don't want to generalize and say, you know, always do it this way, but uh, there are a variety of heat sources today uh, that are going back to a, uh, let me back up actually. Let, let's roll ourselves back to the 50s. Most of those heat sources back then were, were boilers and they were either cast iron sectional boilers or steel fire tube boilers. And just the geometry of the heat exchanger in a boiler like that lends itself to very, very low pressure drop. So uh, putting a, for example, a residential cast iron boiler in a piping circuit actually only requires to drive that flow through that boiler at a, at a nominal 10 GPM. Uh, a typical cast iron boiler, you need about one watt of pumping power input to make that flow go through that boiler. It's very, very minimal restriction. It's, you almost want to think of the boiler as if it's a little tank from the standpoint of pressure drop. So we had that characteristic and then as, as the industry evolved more into compact wall hung boilers, uh, going back uh, again now probably 20 to 25 years ago, 
Uh, some of these early designs for compact heat exchangers and boilers are very tight coils of stainless steel, as an example. And they have very different flow restriction characteristics compared to a cast iron boiler or a steel fire tube boiler. And those that were in, this, in the industry back then probably remember there were a lot of problem jobs as some of the first condensing boilers came into the market because installers were simply assuming I could take the old cast iron boiler out and I could just put this new boiler in its place and connect supply and return and be done with it. But they completely changed the uh, flow resistance characteristic of that heat source and all of a sudden problems that didn't exist started to show up. And, and again, you can look at it from a manufacturer standpoint, building a boiler with a compact heat exchanger, obviously it builds a small boiler, a light boiler, that's easier for an installer to handle. It uses less material, which keeps the cost down. So there are definitely motivations to do that, but the downside is it does create significantly higher flow resistance, and our industry understands at this point that when you do that, when you use that type of a heat source, typically use a dedicated circulator and a pair of closely spaced tees or go into a buffer tank or somehow hydraulically separate that boiler from the balance of the system. That being said, over the last few years, we've seen a number of companies step up with modulating condensing capable boilers that have much lower flow resistance. And the nice thing about that is it opens the possibility for uh, direct flow. It, 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 and, and again, I, I don't want to say it makes it possible in every case for direct flow. I said it opens the possibility. Look at the system, look at what the minimum flow requirement is through the boiler, uh, look at what the pressure drop is through the boiler, and can, can that be used in that application. Uh, if you have lots and lots of zoning, especially if some of these zones are very small, you're still going to get into a situation, uh, without a buffer tank that is, you're still going to get into a short cycling situation if one of those very small zones is calling for heat at say 2,000 BTUs per hour and the boiler can only modulate down to say 8 or 10,000 BTUs per hour. It doesn't solve the short cycling problem, but in systems without that microzoning, uh, I, I definitely see a trend in the right direction that by going directly through the boiler with low flow resistance, we eliminate the need for a dedicated boiler circulator and even a small nominal 125th horsepower circulator, uh, let's say it operated for 3,000 hours a year over a typical 20-year design life, that's several hundred dollars worth of electricity in most cases. And it might even, in some high-rate uh, spaces, it might even be over $1,000. So it's not so much the cost of the circulator, it's the operating cost over the life of the system. So if we can eliminate the need for a dedicated heat source circulator, because we have a boiler that has low flow resistance, it's 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 simpler, and ultimately it's less uh, uh, it, it's more efficient. So I'm I'm all for that, and I, I I'd love to see, for example, I'd love to see a ground source heat pump, a water to water ground source heat pump, that also has that characteristic where we could pump directly through it, and we could, for example, we could reduce the uh, pumping power requirement in the earth loop, and um, you know. Hydraulically, those are all improvements in the system. And then as far as pump selection for that, um, do you have a preference on, uh, you, you, would you talk about delta T versus delta P pumping and what the uh, what to be aware of when you're selecting one over the other? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting situation. I, I tend to prefer uh, pressure regulation. It's, it's immediate. It doesn't require any kind of temperature sensing. Uh, it actually responds uh, based on the hydraulic characteristics of the system as they change. And it's independent of uh, temperature control such as outdoor reset. If, if you're using outdoor reset, uh, you can run into a situation with constant delta T enforcement. In other words, if you have a pump doing constant delta T, uh, the heat transfer will actually drop off a little faster than it should once we get that supply water temperature down. So um, there are good applications for temperature-based variable speed pumps. Uh, boiler protection with a dedicated circulator uh, for boiler protection, I, I think it's a fantastic application. Uh, another one that I think is a really good application is injection mixing. Uh, 
uh, either a fixed temperature injection mixing or incorporating outdoor reset into the uh, calculation of what the supply temperature should be. Those are both very good legitimate temperature-based variable speed pump applications. Uh, the Delta T1 is a little tougher. Um, as I say, I, in looking at the system where we've got up here now, that home run system, um, I, I just think a, a pressure regulated circulator is an ideal fit for that type of a distribution system. Yeah, so I mean, one of the questions that comes up a lot on some of the chat rooms and stuff like that is if you have, you know, you design a system for a certain delta T, it's only efficient at that delta T. So if the delta T falls off or increases or something like that, the efficiency of the system goes away. And that by enforcing a delta T, you can limit the cycling of the boiler because it's always going back at the design for a delta T. Um, I know, to my no. way of thought, if the boiler's cycling, it means there's, you know, you got too big a. You know, another potential issue would be where uh, the, the variable speed pump has its own logic and perhaps the, the boiler modulation, uh, the combustion fan modulation has its own logic and these two, these two control systems have no idea that they're matched up in the same overall system. So one ends up chasing the other if they don't respond uh, in, a, in a coordinated manner. Uh, you can have a modulation trying to follow the delta T or the delta T T trying to track the modulation, and uh, again, we, we may see uh, future refinement of the concept. I, I don't want to say it's you know it's not a bad concept, but in an application where we have valve-based zoning, whether it's TRVs or zone valves or manifold valve actuators, uh, I I tend to like the delta P-based control on, in a system like that. Let's see, let me try one more here. We talked about that. Yeah, I think we did a pretty good job of uh, getting everything. So I want to thank you for your time and for all your uh, dedication to the industry. And uh, we hope everybody comes back next time. I know there's another webinar starting as we speak. So I think a lot of people are starting to jump off and trying to, to get in on that one too. So any closing thoughts from anybody at Cloppy? How are we doing, uh, Woody or anybody else? I think we're good to wrap it up. We're all good here. Well, thanks, everybody, and thanks again. We'll see you on the next one.